Hello and welcome to Extraordinary with me, James Wallace, the podcast that shines a light on ordinary people who have gone on to do and see extraordinary things. And in this episode, I'm joined by social media influencer and former reality TV star, it's Sean Lineker. I guess I'm interested to understand how you went from fresh-faced, innocent Sean Lineker to kind of this face of the London gay well, I was always terrified of being found out to be gay or someone calling me gay, so I really, really repressed it. Sometimes I feel more self-conscious going into a gay venue than I would like a normal restaurant. And I just feel sometimes that gays can be really judgmental and it can become a kind of, and not to like glamorize it, but it can become a like a mean girl mentality. And I couldn't be any further away from like the, the pictures that I post. They're just a picture. I am probably one of the most insecure people that you can meet like I've got terrible body dysmorphia even like with my face as well like I've got such body dysmorphia a lot of gay men want to have sex so it's difficult to make friends if your Instagram is anything to go by no one knows if you're a nice person or they yeah. just think you're extremely bad one thing I've also about Clapham is it has got a really bad reputation there is lovely people that live in Clapham it isn't all just people sat on the common in speedo it was just unhealthy and it was toxic and I really needed to like reevaluate what I was doing with my life I, I never feel like my body's good enough ever, ever ever no matter how much I go to the gym or yeah never have you ever taken anything enhancers before we begin this episode, please don't forget that this podcast is not sponsored or monetized in any way, which is why I've signed up to buymeacoffee.com, which is a platform that allows content creators like me to raise funds to contribute towards the ongoing costs and maintenance of running a podcast. So if you did want to contribute just a small amount, I've set my price at just £3, so it really is just the price of a coffee. You'll find the link in my link tree and in the show notes below. And lastly, if you do enjoy this episode, please don't forget to like and subscribe from wherever you're listening from, whether it's YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon. This support really does go a long way and it does help keep the podcast keep going and growing. With that being said, and without any further ado, enjoy the show. Sean Lineker, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you getting on? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for making the time. I'm excited. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast, to be honest. It's like when we started chatting on TikTok, obviously, it's where all good conversations take place. So I just feel like you've got such an interesting story. So I'm really excited about um, everything you've got to say today. Let's kick things off. And for those who don't know who you are, tell everyone who you are and what you do. Um, so I've, I've, well, I worked in um, gay media and publishing for, I think, for like the past five or six years um, and I also appeared on two reality shows Shipwrecked and The Challenge um, so yeah that's and at the moment I'm not really doing anything I'm kind of having a midlife crisis and trying to decide what I want to do fair enough I, I, hopefully you're not at a midlife stage just yet because you're no. still relatively young how old are you are you 32 I've just turned 32 32 okay fine so we're, we're the same age so let's kick things off and go back to your formative years what was your your childhood like how does the story of Sean Lineker begin um so my dad was in the army um so growing up I moved around a lot so I lived in um, my British horses bases in Germany, in Belgium, and then finally moved back to England for uni. Um, I went to Bournemouth uni. So um, yeah, it was quite chaotic. I had to like adjust a lot to a new environments and schools. Do you feel like that kind of moving around has, has played a role in your adult life at all? Um, I feel like it's been a positive and a negative because um, I feel I found it really difficult to settle in schools because at one point I was going to like an international school, an international American school, and I found it really hard to like fit into that school um, because obviously they're all American. Um, and you'd think the culture wouldn't be that different, but it was like to go through that at the age of like 30, um, mm. when you're just sitting in your teenage years, it was really difficult. And then this was like an international American school in Belgium. Um, so the whole thing was just completely different to anything that I was used to. Um, but yeah, the moving around really, I think, had an effect on me. It had its positives and negatives, but um, yeah, it was just a really different, different like childhood. Mm. 
did you because i guess one of the things that most people i guess people who don't move around in their school life have school friends like yeah. you, you you go to one school from the age of i don't know sometimes four all the way to 18 and that those people stay in your life forever i'm imagining that can't have been the case in in your situation because you, if you were moving schools around and then you move countries you kind of like people are coming and going all the time yeah so i mean I, again it's it's probably a massive positive and a negative because i've got friends all over the world but i wouldn't say like growing up i had any long-term friends because <laughs> they were all moving around as well they lived in they were army families and they were moving to different bases in germany and england um and obviously when i was at the american school they'd moved to america so yeah it was difficult and you'd make like best friends with someone for two years and they'd, they'd be off somewhere else so um I got to meet a lot of different people from a lot of different cultures, but it was never like a long-term friendship. That was like for like a lifetime. From a mental health perspective then, and just figuring out your sexuality, did you have relationships, friendships, girlfriends, boyfriends? Like at what stage did you start to develop that side of things? I was, I think I was in such denial. Um, I really, really pushed it to the, the furthest part of like the back of my brain as I could. Um, it was... The environment growing up, it was like it was all army children. So they they kind of um, wanted to be like their dads. So they wanted to be in the army, um, and I literally had no interest at all. <laughs> um, but I wanted to fit in, so I tried my best to um, to like. I think I really repressed my personality. I I really I I was really shy, really like unbearably shy, um, and I would hang out with all the girls. In like the mixed group there'd be like girls and boys um but i was always terrified of being found out to be gay or someone calling me gay so i really really repressed it um <clears throat> and luckily my i had an older brother in the year above me um who i think people wouldn't ever mess with me or bully me because he was always there so i was quite lucky in that sense but um i never really was bullied but i was always very like aware of myself and aware that i didn't want to come across as gay or um ever be kind of like found out got it so then let's talk about kind of your your coming out journey then how how old were you where did it happen had you moved moved back to england was was that kind of an easy process so i think so i, I was at bournemouth um uni and that's when i started um toying well not toying the idea like i'm just <laughs> the fact that i was gay um i'd go on like i think it was like gaydar back in the day where it was on like desktop iconic or... yeah <laughs> Um, and I think it was another site called like Manhunt. <laughs> also iconic, yeah. Um, and I think I met my first boyfriend through Manhunt, and that's and I travel up to London and go and see him. I wasn't out to any of my um, uni housemates even, so it was kind of like I was kind of living two lives. But it came to the point where I was like, okay, I think I'm happy in this relationship. It was really it was quite a short relationship, um, so I decided to come out. To um, and they say they were quite shocked, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> um yeah but they took it really well um and then it wasn't until i think i'd lived in london i was like 23 or 24 i then decided to come out to my family but also my little brother's gay as well and i knew he was gay just by just by the way he acted and just <laughs> dancing topless to like britney and stuff like that so i kind of knew my whole life um so in my, my thought process at the time was i would let him come out first to my mom so um, he, if I came out first it'd be kind of like a, a double blow obviously she wouldn't think like that um, so I let him come out first and like two weeks later I came out wow I mean how how did your mum take that um, she was fine like I did it over whatsapp <laughs> so I don't know her true um, her true expression or thoughts but she was fine okay and how did your brother take it was he surprised well he, he knew I think apparently I'd fallen asleep I think I was in his room, I fell asleep and he saw messages on my phone, like quite explicit messages. Fair enough. Uh, so how old were you when when he saw those messages? Was that like as I'm you were not, kids or? No, no, was like when I was like 21, 22. Oh, yeah. okay. that's amazing. I, I think he kind of knew anyway. I think we, you could just know. Which yeah. When we spoke about it. That's amazing. I mean, how, how do you feel about having a gay brother? Uh, I mean, that's kind of a, a, a nice thing, right? I love it. Yeah, it's really good. Like he just... Like I, I've, I've had some um, issues and problems at the moment, um, 
And he gets it because he understands what London's like. And he understands how the gay scene works. And I think that it, it, there's an element of um, the mental health side to an LGBTQ person and the issues that we face compared to um, being straight. So it's, he, yeah, he just gets it. And he gets kind of what, what I've been going through. That's, that's amazing. And, and I really appreciate you being honest and brave and, and vulnerable in, in opening up to talk about the mental health side of things. And of course, this is why my podcast exists because, and, and why I put so much content out there across TikTok, et cetera, yeah. on, on the mental health side of things, because I agree. I really don't think it is talked about enough. I think what people see on social media on surface level is lots of excessive partying and fun and sassiness and the glitz and the glamour and all of that stuff. But deep down, there is so much trauma and issues that, that lie beneath that. And I just hope one day that the community talks more about that because it it's really sad and, and we're not we're not going to be able to move on and progress as a society or a community until until we start having those conversations. I, I, I do really agree with you. I feel like there's a massive part of the gay scene that people just pretend it isn't there and it, there isn't an issue. I, I don't really know anyone that talks about some of the issues that happen within London. It's kind of just like dusted under the carpet and no one talks about it. Um, yeah, I mean... And how, how would you describe what those issues are, if you could, in like a couple of sentences? Um, from my personal experience, and... I'm, it's not to like play a victim or be like I've been targeted or whatever. But, um, I do think, I think there's been lots of progression in the community. I feel like like looking at like trans people or like how accepting that is. I also do think that sometimes I feel more self-conscious going into a gay venue than I would like a normal restaurant. And I just feel sometimes that gays can be really judgmental and it can become a kind of, and not to like, glamorize it but it can become a like a mean girl mentality and i do feel like sometimes i've been that person and also i'll be targeted for that and i think it's something that really needs to be looked at and people just need to be nicer to each other and i've i've been myself i've probably been not a nice person but also equally i feel like i've been targeted in that mentality so interesting because it is for me sitting here it's I hope you don't mind me saying so, but like you are one of the faces of the london gay community where it is kind of seen as a little bit intimidating and a little bit mean girl mentality you know i'm just imagining you know lots of gay people in london scrolling through instagram and they see like the clapham massier yeah. on their knees in the common on a hot summer's day in speed days it's kind of like but like how does that how does that even happen like that's not to, to many people and i include myself like the the early 20 version of myself in my early 20s like that's extremely intimidating for some people. Yeah, but it's interesting to hear you say, "Well, actually, there's a there's almost like a hierarchy in a food chain there because it's the same." Yeah, you know, for you, you experience the same feelings. But we'll come on to that because I'm really interested to talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. But obviously, we met. I, I we met in London. Yeah. Uh, really innocent. I think we were both like, "Hi, I'm James." Like, "Hi, I'm Sean," and we're like. I think we were both, I was definitely like fresh to London. Yeah. Um, and I, I, well, I was fresh to clubbing. I hadn't been in a relationship. I hadn't yeah. experienced all the things that, um, that I went on to experience. And now I guess uh, I'm a washed up gay with yeah. lots of bruises and scars. Uh, but, but that's interesting in itself, isn't it? Because I think the community does things to you. Oh yeah. Um, that, that kind of wear you down a bit. Um, but the point was, is that we both met each other and we were extremely innocent versions of ourselves do you um and of course back then you didn't have a hundred thousand followers you weren't verified on instagram you weren't a content creator you weren't a reality tv star yeah i guess i'm interested to understand how you went from fresh-faced innocent sean lineker to kind of this face of the london gay yep. world how, how did that happen so funny um I it's definitely just it just fell, I fell into that like area like it wasn't anything that was like oh I'm gonna even going on TV I didn't choose to go on TV it was something that like I got a message on Instagram um, and it was to go on shipwrecked and it's to live on an island for like however long like no one's yeah. saying um, no to that 
I love Shipwreck. Like Shipwreck was one of my favorite yeah, exactly. shows as a kid. Like, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it's just I kind of fell into it, and like not not even in an arrogant way. I feel like um, I was around when Instagram first kind of took off, and it mm. was like there was a certain pe- certain people who would have a large following, and I think like it wasn't even TikTok then; it was it was purely Instagram, and. Um, I would say as well, it's, my Instagram especially it isn't me at all. It's it, de- it definitely became like a it's it's a business. It became like I make money out of it, and my personality is actually quite like reserved and shy. And I think people have such a a, a different opinion. Like a, they they have a a preconceived um, a preconceived a misconception. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of who I am, um, and I can be any further away from like the the pictures that I post. They're just a picture. I think people do get um, too caught up in the type of pictures that people post and judging them on purely their Instagram. And that's probably one of the yeah. reasons why I wanted to do this because I don't actually say that much on my Instagram. It is a lot of pictures. No one, re- I, do- I never really voice an opinion. I never really do much with it. So I thought it would. It is a good, a good um, idea to like actually say something and have an opinion. And yeah totally and again thank you so much for doing that and there's also i'd imagine and i guess i can say this and you can't but it kind of helps that you're good looking and you've got a muscular physique right that tends to work well (laughs) yeah i mean yeah to post a picture fine but um i am probably one of the most insecure people that you can meet like and it does definitely come out and the instagram side of it is definitely a form of validation and it probably is for any person that posts instagram um like i've got terrible body dysmorphia um even like with my face as well like i've got such body dysmorphia that people probably don't think i do and they probably think that i just say it for like sympathy but i do i genuinely like my body will never be perfect in my head no matter what i do um and i think that's the same for a lot of people that post on instagram because you're comparing yourself to something that the pictures i tend to like perfect lighting at the gym after i've worked out my body doesn't even look like that so um it's unrealistic and it is a form of validation and i'll never be happy with my body so all these other people that are posting these photos they aren't happy with their body that you can never be happy 100 percent happy with your body i don't think and i guess it's a vicious cycle because you'll post something of you know a great picture of you you know like you said with with great lighting after a, a, a workout so you're all pumped up and you get i don't know x thousand of x thousand light I guess that gives you the dopamine hit that you need to basically do it again and again and again. And well, yeah. does that make the insecurities worse almost? It is because you put a stand, you, you're making the standard of yourself so high. Um, like people can pay you to your Instagram photos. And yeah, it's, it's like you're trying to keep up this appearance. And yeah, it's just a photo. And I feel like people judge so much on what you post on Instagram and who you are as a person. And it couldn't be any further from the truth. No. So I have like I've said it so many times. I have such a bittersweet relationship with social media. Like it's been, it's given me so many opportunities in life. Um, but also it's messed up so many relationships. It's it's been actually quite toxic. But I do feel like there's a whole other side to social media now. Like with TikTok, I feel like that's a lot more healthier, and you actually see a real side to someone's life. There's loads of like advice. You can you can look at people's um, life in a more realistic way. It isn't just a static photo of someone at the gym. I'm really getting into um, TikTok at the moment. You should do it. You should do it. You should become a a keynote speaker because I honestly, I'm already kind of like so engaged with with your story. And I think hearing you say these things is going to have such an impact on so many people listening. And I think people are going to be really surprised because I think you're right. Instagram is like the ultimate filter of life. It's like a little window that we all have into what other people look like where they go it's the same with like what restaurants they eat at what holidays they go to everything is like bougie and excessive yeah but like you never know who's paying for it how they got there why they're there all of that sort of stuff and i think to i have exactly the same relationship with social media i think it is uh, very bittersweet i've been able to you know use it as a platform for my podcast obviously with tiktok like you say but yeah back in the day when i was in toxic relationships it would be the source of all evil like i would be because you used to be able to also see i remember who liked whose pictures as well like in your news feed it used to say like so and so like so and so's picture i'd be like why do you like that picture <laughs> how do you know them who have you stepped with like you it would just like trigger all yeah. of these like horrible games 
uh, which again i think is actually quite pertinent to the uh lgbt space rather than like the heterosexual world anyway so you you've come to london you've come out the closet you're you know very innocent you've got loads of instagram followers now like how did you find your people in london like how did you start building kind of your network and your friendships and do you have any sort of thoughts or reflections on on that i if i'm honest i really really struggled to make friends when i first moved to london um i had like a group of friends who i met from through going out when i first moved to london and i remember them lovely people um yeah lovely people um but i do feel like and this is not me naming anyone it wasn't that group of people but a lot of gay men want to have sex so it's difficult to make friends so and if you reject them or if you're not interested then they don't want to be your friends that's what how i found it when i first came to london not so much now um so i really struggled because i didn't i didn't want a boyfriend i wanted friends yeah um and this was like back in the day um and then i moved to clapham and one thing i will say about clapham is it has got a really bad reputation i will give a but not everyone is a muscle like not everyone is a reputation that it gives out there is lovely people that live in Clapham. I mean, it isn't all just people sat on the common in speedos um but also there is that um and there is a few select people who aren't nice people and they are i would say like bitchy toxic but there is to equal it out there is so many nice people in Clapham as well so some i do get frustrated when people do tarnish everyone in Clapham with that brush yeah. Um, but yeah, I moved to Clapham and um, made a new group of friends there. Um, but yeah, it has a lot of my friends have been ba- a lot. A lot of them have been based around partying. But I do have good friends who I just I know they will always be there for me, and I can message them whenever I need them. Um, but yeah, I do think it is difficult to make friends in London. I do feel like a lot of it is based around um, partying and that that side to it. And then, like, deep down then, because I guess coming from the reserved and quite shy person that you naturally are, and then you get kind of sprung into this world of partying and, I guess, the Clapham gaze, put a very unfair um, sweeping statement, I know. Uh, <laughs> but did you did you find yourself having, like, internal battles? Because I guess in, in a situation where you're doing, like, wee parties or circuit parties and you're going to, like, I can't remember what they used they used to be or room service. Yeah. Like, what, what else did they used to be? Um, Loads of things. Lows, like all the voxel scene. Um, yeah. Like, th- like, did you want to go out? Like, did you feel like to make friends or to be included, you had to do things you didn't want to do? Um, yeah, I guess to a, a certain degree. Um, I mean, it's always always been my decision. I've always, I've always enjoyed going out, but I also think that... Um, I think because I am quite shy and quiet, it does come across as rude. So I feel like I do have that reputation. <laughs> but it's, I'm not at all. Like I'm really friendly. I'm not rude at all. But um, I do feel like I did. I, I did party too much, and it, it did come to a point recently where I just had to like completely cut it out. Um, and I think I lost my good friends through hanging around with some of the wrong people, um, which I feel like is so easily done in London, and I feel like it's not spoken about enough. But yeah, I think it's just, it's difficult. I feel like it's a very difficult area to live, especially if you're gay. Um, yeah. Sorry, so, just just on that, but what, what's not spoken about enough? Just like losing friends to partying. I think just how you can lose yourself in London and go into like a, go into like a toxic partying scene. Um, and it's so easily done. Um, partying in London can go on for days. There's always a nightclub open. There's always something going on. Yeah. Um, and I feel like a lot of people do get lost in that. So was there a straw that broke the camel's back? I always get confused with that statement. I think that's <laughs> right. Um, what, was there something that happened where a penny dropped and you were just like, no, I can't do this anymore. I'm leaving London and going back home. Yeah, I think around like Christmas time, I just I was always trying to... I, I guess I, I had a, a, a problem like with partying and going out and it just was like too much. Uh, I just couldn't pull myself out of it. So the only way to pull myself out of it was to, I think my problem was London. Like if I'm not in London, yeah. away from the, I'm away from the problem. Um, I, I don't know if that's fixing the problem or just putting a bandaid on the problem, but it's for now working. Um, 
I definitely feel like there's something about uh, and and people often talk about running away or to your to your phrase putting a band-aid over it but there's something about not giving the bad things in your life the energy yeah. that's going to negatively impact you so if it means leaving leaving it or ignoring it or deleting it then that's a positive thing it's the same way that i think you know i block people on instagram that i don't want to see or i don't want to be associated with and it out of sight out of mind so i definitely feel like it's a positive thing i guess the bigger question is though like do you miss it like is there is there parts of london where like oh i just wish i could go to mighty hoopla or whatever it is that you yeah no i that's going on. Well, like my hoopla things like that i miss and i wish like i was able to do that but right now i feel like it's best that i stay away um saying that i am going to london pride and that will be that will be the big test <laughs> um but yeah i think for now that, that is that slightly more wholesome though as in like yeah, do, you, yeah. do you feel, feel like you don't give yourself the options to make like better decisions yeah. i know that sounds really patronizing but i guess we all have like in london you can go to heaven and have a really like cute twinky night out uh, sure. with like 18 year olds or you could go to like i don't know what well, you can go to like roast and things like that. Sorry to judge people that go to roast. I'm sure it's great, but like, I guess that there's always a spectrum of of options available. I think that I think what it is is I don't judge any nightclub in London, and I think it that it works for every type of personality. But what I will say is, is having self control, which I lost. Um, so that that's been my issue. But if someone wants to go to roast or they want to party for however long, that's fine. But it's having self control, and that's something that I've struggled with. So um, yeah, it's just kind of really putting myself back out there, but being a lot more sensible. Like I'm 22 now, I can't be running around <laughs> like I can't be running around like that. I can just about get through a day of work. In I know office, exactly. Honest, and I, I can't do it anymore. Well, um, three glasses of the wine, and I'm dead the next day. Now, <laughs> literally. Well, it's, it's actually quite scary how our bodies just like change Shut down. Uh, at your lowest then like what kind of what's like the worst thing that you found yourself doing are you talking about like four day benders like how long were you going for um it kind of all stemmed from lockdown i think i think i just lost my like i lost my routine i lost my i just lost who i was like, i was complete i had nothing to do um and again that's you can find stuff to do but just, the whole routine of my life was gone and then when lockdown ended it was just kind of like being let out of prison <laughs> yeah um, yeah yeah yeah. and yeah i think that i don't want to go into too much detail of like what i did and how i was but it was just unhealthy and it was toxic and i really needed to like reevaluate what i was doing with my life and i could have really really messed things up for myself amazing well, obviously not amazing, but amazing that you stopped yourself <laughs> and and you had sort of some self control and yeah. there was an intervention. Did your friends intervene? Like, did you have friends and family around you that sat you down and was said like, Sean, like, no, this has got to stop. Um, I think a lot of my friends are going through a similar thing to me, so I don't think a few of them are in the place to even help me because they're dealing with their own issues as well. But. Um, no. When I did go home and tell my family, that really was a turning point and they've been really helpful and supportive and I think they don't want me to leave the house at the moment. But <laughs> Do you think there's something in it? Because I think people of our age, and this is what I'm reading about at the moment in, in The Velvet Rage, which I don't know if you've read it or not, but I do wonder if there's something about having some sort of second awakening in your 30s where you where everything kind of starts to make a bit more sense and you yeah. get a bit more clarity and only now in my early 30s am i am i starting to understand how much pain i was in as a as a teenager and in my 20s like the things that i thought were really wholesome and is, innocent you know going to freedom every friday night and every he a saturday every saturday going to heaven every saturday night was like yeah it was fine at the time but like what i was doing i was just like looking for validation the whole time and i think that kind of creeps up on you eventually yeah. yeah no for sure and yeah you can't be doing that when you're in your 30s and you need to have a more of a focus on your career and that that side to your life so i do really agree with the like the, the saying about um the pan syndrome and like a lot of gay men don't experience their teenage years in their in their teenage years so they do it in their 20s that definitely was true for me um and yeah it's, and me it's more, you've just you've, you've got it out of your system and you need to just focus on 
your career and that whole like party inside you it needs to needs to stop <laughs> it really does and the parties i don't know if they were always there but i guess as we've got older you i'm more exposed i feel like the extremity of the parties got bigger like i only knew really innocent pop night but now there's like clubs and i'm sure they were always there i just wasn't aware of them but there are clubs with dark rooms and they're more sex-based and mm -hmm. clothing is optional and like everyone's topless and it's just everything has become a little bit more sexualized i think no I, yeah i do agree and i think um even when i speak to uh, um gay men who are slightly older than me like i think their clubbing experience was very different to ours i think there's always yeah. a moment of like um it being a bit sexual but if you speak to some people like they they would go and it would be just people having fun having a laugh and i feel like a lot of different types of drugs change that on the london scene yeah yeah maybe it's drug space you're right um and one thing i just wanted to touch on which we don't have to go into too much detail on was was only fans as well <laughs> how did you find yourself getting involved with that um that was more that, that happened in lockdown because i was i was made um, I was let go of my role, so I was struggling with money. So, I don't, as I've always said, I don't judge anyone that that, that has done OnlyFans. And I now, while well, I did do it, I've actually got rid of it, but I might bring it back. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a great source of income, and yeah, I've I've got no issue with it. And yeah, does nothing. it does it make as much money as everyone says it does? Me personally, I I never really did it one hundred percent like properly, but yeah, yeah. people make. I know people that have made like a hundred thousand in a year. Wow. Yeah. And then do you have any sort of, cause I guess a lot, what a lot of people saying, but I know my, I've been asked it a million times and we talk about it in the, in the gay WhatsApp groups. It's like, would you do it if you, if no one else could find out about it? And everyone's like, well, yeah, of course. Like I, I'd happily sort of get my kit off for a hundred grand a year. But I guess the flip side of it is, is that when you do do it, like it is public. Yeah. So I guess the question is, like, do you have any issues with friends and family knowing about it? Or um, do they just not know about it? Well, I think my whole family know about it now. And I feel, <laughs> I think um, a lot of my photos appeared in other places, obviously, to be fans. Um, like where? Uh, I, well, I, well, there's a, there was this person who, um, he looks after, like, I can't remember his name, actually, and I, I lost his contacts, but he looks after, like, um, people posting other people's photos to whatsapp groups and like oh, online and to the, all these like forums that people so there is certain forums which i won't mention because i think they're awful but people will talk about other people on them and post their content and it's really nasty so he would let me know if someone posted my videos or my or saying stuff about me i'd have to email them to get them to take, to take it down um so yeah once it is online it, it's always going to be there and it's difficult to track where it's where it's going and where it's being copied to. Um, yeah. yeah. So you have like, there's no like, you're quite comfortable with it. There's no, there's no regrets there or anything like that. I think most of mine's been taken off on taken off the internet now. Um, so I feel like if you're going to do it, you have to you have to commit to do it and doing it properly. Um, yeah. But yeah, I have no problem. But fair enough. They make really good money. So yeah. And does it ever cause a problem with dating or speaking to, to other guys? Like, do they ever take issue with it? Um, I don't think I've ever had a problem with it, but I know certain people wouldn't agree with it or wouldn't date someone who does OnlyFans. Um, but the, the, when I did do OnlyFans, it wasn't ever with other people. It was just like shots of myself. So um, I think there is a bit of a difference between, because some, some of the... Um, some of the OnlyFans creators, obviously, it's like full videos with other people. So I think there is a bit of a difference. Yeah, obviously. Like with all kind of in the porn world, there's obviously a huge spectrum and variety of things you can you can do and be. So let's talk about uh, your kind of blow up, I guess, and, and how you ended up on, on reality t TV. And I know you said at the beginning, like, being on TV isn't something you ever thought was going to happen. No. But you are in a position now where I'm sure you do get noticed quite a lot when, not just in London, but just obviously you've got, you've been on TV in America, what have you, like, have you had in your mind, like, a, a taste of 
fame of what it feels like to be recognized um, i think really minor a really minor taste but um yeah i mean i i never ever ever plan to go on tv and i feel like i i'm not <laughs> i'm not the type of person who fits on tv and i definitely fell into it um I think it all just stemmed from Instagram. And as we said earlier, like I had such a big Instagram following that I feel like in London, people kind of know of me or know who I am. But yeah, I would never say that I'm famous. How do you respond to like attention though? Because I, I guess every time you upload a story or a picture, you know, I went on as I was preparing for this podcast, I went on your social, your socials, which I feel like is a very old person thing to say. But I went on your um your Instagram, what have you, and like underneath every picture is just like hundreds of like fire emojis and like the squirting water emojis. Like, <laughs> do you like how do you feel? I mean, you laugh, and I'm and I guess it is funny, but like to be on the receiving end of that, either that could be extremely validating for you, and you're like, that's great, I'm so hot, or it's kind of like you you've objectified yourself a little bit and yeah. i'm just trying to work out in your eyes like how do you feel or is it because i know how addictive social media is like yeah. i get it a bit now with tiktok you know i'm getting my my the, the views i'm getting are going up and up and up and up and i can feel like the dopamine in myself like rising and i want to do it again and again and again and like if one gets a hundred thousand followers i'm like oh, i want this one to get two hundred thousand so yeah. not followers views etc so i i get it i get the addiction but trying to work out in your head like where where you sit on that um well i think like, i put the i put the photos out there so um i guess there's an element of being objectified but it's my decision to do it um i do as i think i said earlier i do want to get more into actually having an opinion and say it more <laughs> rather than just posting topless photos of myself because for one it's just it, it's boring it's so boring and for me it's boring so i just want to and back in the day when I, like, before COVID and during COVID, I was doing, um, I was doing, like, content for, like, Burton's and... Um, yeah, I remember that, yeah. But the thing the thing was, like, back in back then, um, it was literally taking a nice photo of yourself. So to be an influencer now, you literally have to make, like, full-blown movies. <laughs> like, it's a lot of work. Um, like, you see some of the content on TikTok, it's amazing. Um, but it was just such a different thing back in my day. Yeah. Years, if I'm old, but like a few years ago, um, no, I completely agree. Like we're 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 a bit late to the party, aren't we? Yeah, um, but I would love to do more of that. But um, yeah, I just feel like I I really pigeonholed myself with the topless photos, and it was even I I did it even more back in like I'd say like 2016, 17, 18, and I've tried to stop doing it as much. Um, but yeah, I guess there's an element of validation as well. I think lots of people want to hear what you've got to say. I think I think you should start a whole new profile or change your name on Instagram, like Sean Lineker, the Reformed Gay, <laughs> and, and then you do like a whole content series on on talking about all of these issues. Yeah. Or we start a podcast together, or start a oh, whole new podcast great. series. So the gym, the gym is another thing. A love hate relationship that lots of people have and gays in particular i mean I, i'm always mind blown like when you go to pride and you just see like how muscular the gays t and again massive generalization but it just feels like gays are so into their bodies yeah do you think there will ever come a day where you aren't addicted if you can call it an addiction to um, to the gym uh for me, it's it is both. It's vanity, and it ge it generally just makes me feel better. But I I completely agree. Like the pressure I feel sometimes to look good, and it's pre it's pressure that I put on myself. Like I I one hundred percent put it on myself, but I put such pressure on my body and to look really perfect all the time. And it's yeah. always really unhealthy, and I it's something that I need to work on myself. And it's something that has built up over the years of living in London. Um, because I just need to be a lot more relaxed with it. But yeah. Um, I do feel massive pressure. If I see, if I go out and I see people's people with really good bodies, I feel pressure to have that as well. Um, and it's something I've always struggled with. But I'd imagine in the circles that you're in, it it does feel like that because when you're surrounded by good bodies the whole time, it's like you feel quite exposed. Yeah, I I never feel like my body's good enough ever, ever, ever. No matter how much I go to the gym or yeah, never. Have you ever taken anything? enhancers um, if you will i'll be honest i have and i feel like once you do that it, it becomes even more of an issue because your body your body gets to a point where you you can never get it unless you take them 
So you'll get your body to such a good physique that unless you take these enhancers, you can't have that body. And that then plays even more into your um, like body dysmorphia. And loads of people I know for sure take stuff, but they would never in a million years admit it. That's what I find so interesting because... I've always been really open about it. I've always, I've always said that I have and like I've, I've done steroids or whatever. Can you tell people who have and haven't? I can, yeah. And I know I can tell straight away. And I know a lot of people still deny it. <laughs> Why do they deny it? I don't know. I wouldn't, but I think I don't know. Do you still do it today? Um, I take testosterone. No comment. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. I want to do a whole new pod episode on testosterone because that's another kind of topic that keeps coming up. And like what happens when you hit 30 and your t- testosterone levels drop and all that kind of stuff. Is that is taking testosterone different to taking steroids? Or is it the same? Well, um, I don't know. Personally, I don't know. But I do know that my testosterone levels are really low. And to go to the gym and have energy, I just decided to stay on it. So I just stay on it constantly. Interesting. I nice to anyone, by the way, because I don't know if that's a good thing to do. <laughs> that's just what I'll do. No, no, no. I've, I've, I, because I had a, a situation recently actually where I was feeling really low in energy, and one of the tests they did was testosterone. Yeah, what, and my, my, my levels were normal, but I, had they been low, they would have put me on them. Yeah. So I know there are people that that take it for that reason. Yeah, like earlier this year, I was just losing loads of weight and I had no energy. I was going to the gym and I just, I was so skinny. So then I, I decided to um, take testosterone and I've gone completely back to the old world. Good for you. <laughs> um, so let's talk about kind of your views then. I know we've touched on it throughout the entire episode, but what are your thoughts generally about the LGBT community? What do you, is there kind of given what's happened to you in the last few months have you got new perspectives like do you have any sort of overriding sort of reflections on on the community at large um for sure like it's a lot more accepting as i said before of like the trans community and i always mention this person because when i first moved to london i i met her outside circa and she came up to me in this like union jack dress and i've kind of watched that um evolution over the past few years like when we off yeah i'm just obsessed with her i think she's like gorgeous and like what she does and how she's changed throughout the years i think she's amazing um and just watching how accepting everyone is of, of the community now um but i do think there's such a divide of like the clackham gays and east gays and i just feel like it's a bit silly um and get tarnishing people with such just one brush yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah do you think there's something in it though? Because back to what we said at the beginning with the whole mean girls mentality. Yeah. I and even now at 32 years old, like you could be walking into Circa and Soho and you will see eight crew because they always have to be on mass, right? There's always 15 people. Like everyone's very, very good looking. Everyone's very hench. And it does feel a little bit exclusive. Yeah. So I, from my perspective, I totally understand like it's always bad to judge and I think the community generally needs to stop or you know try to not be as judgmental as they are I think I lost my my exclusivity card though so I'm not welcome anymore oh no were you, were you booted out I think so yeah <laughs> um, okay well maybe that's a podcast maybe that's part two I need to sort of get the tea on why <laughs> why that happened but but it do- I'm sure they're all lovely people though like, yeah. I, that, that's the thing I think that's why it's so important that you're coming on this podcast because I think it's important to hear the voice of Sean Lineker because if your Instagram is anything to go by no one knows if you're a nice person or they yeah. just think you're extremely bad yes <laughs> it's true no I 100% agree and I, 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 I couldn't have put it better myself and I that, I get frustrated sometimes and it's not me like being like oh poor me but like I do I am tarnished with that brush and people do have this opinion of me that I am very aware of and it's, it couldn't be further from the truth because I genuinely am just shy and um, I just put topless photos on Instagram. Like, it's not a big, big thing. No, I know. And, and do you know what's funny? is like, had I have not known you when we were really young, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know that because yeah. I know that you're a decent person. Um, but I guess that this is the toxic side of, of social media. Yeah. You never know. And, and to your point earlier, I think that's why TikTok is um 
in my personal opinion, like a better platform and slightly more positive. Yeah. Because you, you know, there's nowhere to hide. It's less filtered. And also, like, I can't complain at all because I, I put myself out there. So, yeah. I get why, because if you scroll down to my Instagram feed from 2016, 2017, every single picture was a selfie or when I had a better body, I was topless or in the gym or I, I, I get it because there was something extremely validating about it. And one of the reasons I don't do it anymore mainly is because I don't have a good body. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe if I did, it would be different. Before we go into the final section, what do you think? And I think I know the answer to this, but. What is the biggest misconception about you? I think I don't. I don't know for sure, but I feel like people think that I'm like this nasty person who's cold and like. But I'm. I'm it couldn't be any further from the truth. Like I'm. I think I'm a nice person. <laughs> I'm just. I'm gen generally just shy, and people put that to like a post photo on Instagram. I think that's no, no. what people think of me. But I obviously, I, I don't know for sure. Do you ever know? But right. well, it's good that you you think that and you've and you said it and i guess the message there is you've got to stop the judgment and give people opportunities right yeah so one of the things that i ask all my guests to do is write a little letter to their younger selves um or give advice to their younger selves you've already told me kindly that you've not done your homework <laughs> uh but it would be great if you could on the spot or, or have a think about kind of what advice you would give to a younger Sean? I would say to younger Sean that, as cliche as it sounds, that it will be okay. Be yourself, be confident in yourself, and believe in yourself, because that's one of my biggest problems. I don't believe in myself sometimes. And also focus on your career more and stay away from fire. <laughs> <laughs> stay away from fire. I didn't mention that one. I've never been. It's fun, but yeah. In small doses. Right. Stay away from fire. Um, listen, Sean, I found that conversation incredibly insightful. And I think your message is really powerful. I think so many people are going to take a lot of value from that. And hopefully you will be starting a podcast of your own <laughs> called The Reform Gay po Podcast or something like that. Um, and yeah, keep keep doing what you're doing. And, and I'm sure you're going to go on to great things in the next few yeah. months. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on here. Absolute pleasure. Good to see you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you, as always, for taking the time out to listen to this podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I did making it. And please don't forget, if you do want to leave a rating or a review, that would be amazing. It really does help keep the podcast keep going and growing. And lastly, huge thank you to Sean for being so brave and honest and sharing his story with me. Until next time, take care, stay safe, and I'll see you very soon.